Up next, we have Damon Smith. <laughs> Damon is an assistant professor and extension plant pathologist at UW-Madison. Damon's responsibilities include research efforts that focus on improving our understanding of the epidemiology of plant pathogens in order to develop better management recommendations for the sustainable management of field and forage crop diseases. Whew. That's pretty intense. All right, Damon is a native of Western New York State. He earned his bachelor's degree in biological sciences at the State University of New York College at Geneseo. How'd I do? Nice. All right, and his master's and PhD's degrees from North Carolina State University. Prior to Damon's appointment at UW, he was an assistant professor at Oklahoma State. Yes, that's intense, and I'm a pretty intense guy. You guys probably know that already, so. I guess I gotta do this close because you can't hear me. It's the end of the day, right? So I know I'm standing between you and the beer uh, afterwards here. So I'm gonna try to keep this moving along for you and uh, we'll jump right into talking about some diseases. I think you all will agree uh, the last couple of years, the two big ones in corn for us uh, here in the state are northern corn leaf blight and gosses wilt. I know there's some other minor diseases. Uh, we talk about eye spot and some of these other things that, that move in, but I think if we had to you know, classify and pick out the top uh, players here, these, these are the ones that we're looking at. So I wanna take some time. Uh, my, from what I've learned over the past couple of seasons, I think uh, we've got a lot of issue in terms of just trying to tell the difference between these two diseases. And so I just wanna take some time just to kind of tease this out and then we'll look actually at some fungicide data over the last couple of years here in the state. So uh, Goss's wilt, uh, as Annette of Fibs uh, talked about earlier, this is um, uh, sort of a re-emerging issue for us here, especially in Wisconsin. It was discovered here uh, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, so it's not an unusual thing to find here, but we sort of were able to manage it, and I'll talk about why maybe we're seeing some resurgence here. It is caused by a bacterium, okay? So Clavibacter michiganensis, subspecies nebraskensis, that's a lot of... Uh, words in Latin there, and if you're like me, I hate Latin, so we'll just call it the Gosses wilt pathogen. Okay, so uh, it is often confused with northern corn leaf blight because we get these really long, um, uh, sort of broad lesions across the leaf. Okay, and so you can see some of this here in this, uh, this upper slide, again in the lower slide there. It can have two phases. There's the wilt phase and the leaf blight phase. I think you'll agree with me that what do we see most? the leaf blight phase, and that's really what confuses a lot of us, and it is found throughout the Midwest here. Some uh, common um, uh, phases here, or things that we see in the leaf blight phase, uh, we, we see these freckles, okay? So how many are familiar with the freckles? Some of you have seen these. Some of you are awake and listening to me, so that's good. So when you don't see the, the um, when you don't have these held up to the backlight, these freckles look dark, okay, scattered throughout this uh, bleached lesion. And then if you hold these up to the light and get some backlight behind them, they will often uh, change to being translucent, okay, in color. This is a really uh, telltale sign here. We, we put a lot of merit, actually, when we're trying to diagnose this in the field on these freckles. The other thing you can do is grab a, a piece of these leaves here and you can actually incubate these in a, in a plastic Ziploc bag with a wet paper towel. And sometimes if you're lucky, you'll get the uh, bacterium actually oozing out of the leaves. So that's a trick. That doesn't always happen, but that is something that, that sort of helps you get uh, to where you need to be. The other thing is, is that uh, the lesions typically will be much longer than a, than a, a northern corn leaf blight lesion. You know, the longest northern corn leaf blight lesions we typically see may be about six inches. Now, what, what the caveat there is those lesions can coalesce, and you will get a larger lesion from the conglomeration of those, but no single lesion will get as large as we see with Goss's wilt in a lot of cases. The other uh, thing to kind of step back and look at is the pattern in the field that you see these, these things occur, because that's really important when you're trying to tell the difference between Goss's and northern corn leaf blight. A lot of times with gosses, we're seeing the symptoms actually starting on the upper portion of the plant, okay? Why is that happening? Well, this is a bacterium that's actually getting inside the plant. It's disrupting the water conducting elements in the plant. And so the farthest zones from the root system obviously are the upper leaves, right? And so those are the first things that get starved by water. And so a lot of times we start to see those symptoms appear at the top. Where's, where's northern corn leaf blight typically start? Those of you who scout down lower in the canopy, right? 
So, you know, northern corn, we typically see it start low and then it sort of progresses up to the top of the plant. There are, you know, sometimes exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, that's what, that's what we see a lot of times. So, you know, in the red zone here on this map, this sort of gives us the historical, uh, what we might call the high risk zone. So you, you've probably all seen data out of uh, Nebraska, that's sort of the hot zone. And of course, there's a lot of irrigated corn there. And so there's a lot of work being done in that area of the country on goss as well. And so we sort of extrapolate some of the management from those areas out to the other areas. Now in about 2010, 2011, we started to see a, again a reemergence of this issue here in the Midwest. And so uh, you'll see this sort of orange blob here on the map starting to stretch out and that's the resurgence zone. This isn't to say that this is new here. Okay? Again, we found it you know, 25 or 30 years ago, but it sort of reemerged for us. Okay? Now we can drill down a little closer. Annetta showed some data from the state lab, which sort of lines up uh, pretty closely with this map. We probably need to combine uh, data here. So this is from our diagnostic lab at UW here, and we've looked at data. I asked Brian to sort of compile uh, data, Brian Huddleston, in our diagnostic lab over the last couple of years. So before 2010, we had no confirmations uh, of Goss's wilt. So 2010, um, we started to look for it, and you see we did find uh, down here in Grant County. And you'll notice down here, Grant Lafayette, year after year after year, this is kind of where we uh, first start to observe gosses, okay, each year. And you'll see in 2015, again, we had uh, uh, gosses down here, and then we had Columbia. Uh, you know, I hear anecdotal evidence uh, over the last couple of years that, you know, Marathon, Lincoln, this part of the states had gosses. This is generally not a, not a zone where we find it, okay? Again, a lot of this is related to the, t the conditions, okay? So higher risk things are, are things that lead to this. Uh, warmer temperatures, lots of rain, and then often some damaging event that, that uh, like a hail event, which allows this bacterium to actually enter. Okay, so bacteria can't just enter the plant cells like uh, northern corn leaf blight can. It has to actually have some wound or other natural opening to get into the plant. So, you know, the patterns we often see, usually around where we see wind damage, hail damage, and those sorts of things. Okay. So why have we seen this, this rise? I borrowed this slide from Marty Chilvers over at uh, Michigan State. I think this really you know, kind of sums things up in a nice bulleted list. We've had a sort of change in production systems over the last few years. Corn prices were strong. So what did we do? We put a lot of corn on corn, okay? This is a residue-borne pathogen, survives in that old corn residue. It also can survive on weeds in the field, okay? So poor weed management can contribute to this. But we think a lot of the residual inoculum is in, in some of this uh, residual corn residue out there, okay? So related to that, minimal till systems, we've had a switch, which I think is a good thing for soil management, but this also is sort of a balance for us now as we try to manage these residue-borne diseases, right? We move to a minimum till or a no-till system, and that leaves a lot of residue around. So opening up the rotations a little here can help us balance that no-till system and balance that residue that's out there. Also, the susceptibility in the hybrids, um, you know, certain genetics out here have allowed us maybe to, uh, we, you know, we had a good handle on it, and then maybe we lost some of that resistance on hybrids selecting for other things like northern corn leaf blight, and so that may have driven uh, some of this as well. And then we also have researchers in our pathology group also looking at the virulence of these uh, pathogens. So they're collecting isolates of this bacteria and investigating that, and it's likely that we have some, some you know, increased virulence here in the Midwest, which is contributing to that. So with that said, because we're dealing with a bacterium, we can't spray a fungicide, and Darren talked about that in the previous talk. So we have to look at other things uh, that, that we can do besides just spraying something, okay? And so here's sort of the management plan in general. Plant the most resistant hybrid you can find, which is appropriate for your zone. Use some tillage maybe if you're gonna shorten the rotations. You know, if we're relying on a corn-on-corn -corn type rotation, then we probably need to do something to manage some of that residue. So maybe switching from no-till to maybe a minimal till, so doing something to try to get that residue breakdown. Again, longer rotations obviously would be advised. I think with the price of corn where we're at now, that might help our decision-making process to get our, ourselves out of this corn-on-corn -corn thing. 
And then good weed management uh, is recommended. So our, our colleague, Darren and my colleague at uh, Purdue, they uh, just published a nice fact sheet actually looking at other grassy weed alternative hosts. So if you search uh, alternative host to Goss's Wild in Google, you'll actually come up with this fact sheet. And I'd encourage you to kind of take a look at that. You know, one of the ones that, that are in there, foxtail, things like that, you know, these they can be alternative hosts and contribute to the to the inoculum loads. And again, remember that fungicides uh, are ineffective here. We've also had uh, some work done both in Nebraska and Indiana looking at um, bactericides and, and, and these sorts of other products out there besides fungicides. And they've been unable to actually find any efficacy uh, towards uh, this bacterium. Okay, so bear that in mind. There's not a lot that we can do in season. We've got to make some preparation in order to manage this. To sort of switch gears here and talk about the other really important disease, we have northern corn leaf blight. Again, this is, you know, this has been a continuing issue, uh, you know, year in and year out. We might have a little bit of it, other years more. The last couple of years, I'd say we've had quite a bit of northern corn leaf blight, and that's probably been our major uh, issue that we've, we've taken a lot of time to control. The major risk factors for northern corn leaf blight include uh, cool, wet environments. So 2015 was, uh, you know, the banner year, really, for the weather conditions that really favor this. We had nice, cool season all the way along. Uh, and then we had, you know, heavy dews and rains that were pretty frequent, and that really favored not only the initial infections, but it also helps these spores move from the lower leaves up to the upper portions of the plant. Uh, there was also, you know, large amounts of residue in our corn-on-corn corn and, and no-till systems, which are probably contributing. Again, we've got a residue-borne pathogen. Maybe some susceptible hybrids out there. Uh, again, a lack of rotation and, and races uh, are an issue here with northern corn leaf blight. So the most prevalent race um, uh, since about 1999 has actually been race one. Uh, race zero was is found in the Midwest, and that was one of the more predominant races in the 90s, and then we had a shift to this race one. And more recently, we were, there's some evidence that suggests uh, another shift. So that could be also contributing to some of what we're seeing in terms of, of maybe an uptick in northern corn leaf blight. Just to show you some symptoms up close here, so this the, the, sort of the telltale symptom, again, is that cigar-shaped lesion. Again, these things don't get much bigger than maybe six, seven inches long, but they can coalesce if you get enough of them on a leaf, and you can see there's a couple of these lesions starting to coalesce here. Okay, so that's where people start to get confused. Now, one nice uh, thing that does happen with northern corn leaf blight is that it's a, it's a prolific sporulator, okay? And especially when we have heavy dew. So if you get out there in the morning, you're doing some scouting, a lot of times you'll see this gray uh, growth on the, in the middle of the, these lesions, and that's actually the sporulation. If you had your handy microscope out in the field and could look at this, uh, this is what you'd see. You'd see a lot of little hairs here and then these little banana-shaped spores uh, actually on the ends of these hairs. So each of these lesions can give rise to thousands of spores, okay? Then you can have hundreds of lesions on a plant containing thousands of spores. You quickly got, uh, uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of these things just moving around. And this is one reason why if the conditions are really conducive, you can have it move pretty quick, okay? You can see it just, you know, I hear people talk about, well, it just blazed through my corn in a week. And that, that can happen if the conditions are right just because of the number of spores you see here. In terms of management, uh, choosing a resistant hybrid, I, you know, you're going to always hear a pathologist go to resistance first. We still think that's a great tool and probably the foundation of any good uh, integrated management uh, plan. You're going to need more than the old HT1 resistance. Uh, it's not going to be uh, effective against uh, race one. Uh, you're going to have to look at things with the HTN or HTM1, HTM2, et cetera. Okay? So those things will uh, pick up the resistance to some of the other races that uh, may be predominating uh, the populations. Again, managing corn residue, I think, where the prices of corn are at, that's going to help us, again, try to get ourselves out of this continuous corn uh, rotation, open the rotations up here, which will help us with the, with the residue management. I'm going to kind of jump to the punchline for the rest of the talk here right off the bat. I gave my students a little lecture about foreshadowing and literature, and you can kind of give the punchline away early and then show the data here. So. You know, really, we know from a lot of work, which I'm going to show you here in a minute, the best chance for economic return uh, in the upper Midwest here is usually if a fungicide is applied around VTR1, okay? Again, because we're starting to see diseases start at that time, and then we're trying to preserve yield on those ear leaves, and so... 
if, if there's active disease happening prior to tasseling, then we, we would likely see some success with a fungicide application. If there's not really much happening prior to that tasseling period, then the success goes down quite a bit. Okay, so that's a really critical timing for us. So, you know, the goal here is again to protect those ear leaves and that VT timing is, is, is really the place that you want to be out there uh, doing some scouting. So what about using uh, fungicides on field corn? You know, there's a lot of debate out there on whether we should just be recommending spraying fungicides across, you know, corn and soybeans and just take the yield benefits that we get. Again, like Darren alluded, I don't think it's that simple. Okay, I think you really do need to consider a few things here. Uh, we've got some pretty good evidence now. This table here is actually compiled by Kirsten Wise, however, myself, Darren, and, and a lot of the pathologists in the Corn Belt in the U.S., <clears throat> we all contribute data to this every year, okay? And Kirsten updated this table for us. So what you're looking at here is the different years where we had studies, and these are, there's, there's, we're getting up into the thousands of studies now across these, this six-year period. So there's a lot of observations in here that give us these means. And what you're looking at is just looking at timing, regardless of the amount of disease out there, what's the benefit over not treating across the corn belt at these various timings, okay? So if you just want to jump here to the six-year average, you can kind of see there's some ups and downs across year, you know, depending on weather and the response in the corn hybrids and that sort of thing. You can see on average about two bushels at the earlier timings of application, that standard timing uh, at the V2 to R2 uh, stage, giving us almost five bushels. And then the double application, if we went early and then came back later, Later with a two-pass program actually not giving us much added benefit um, over the single pass and this is so this is one of the reasons why you know we're really sort of focusing in here again on the VT because we see you know if we're just gonna spray regardless of the disease levels the odds and the, and the added bushels are probably a little higher at that stage versus maybe the two-pass or the the V5 to V8. I would argue, you know, in your decision-making process, the other thing that you probably, you know, really need to consider, and I'm sure all of you do as good uh, farm managers, is you got to look at the pricing, okay? And I've showed these slides before, and prior to, you know, last year, uh, we were really talking about things that listed, had a list price up here around 18 to maybe $24. And I know my industry colleagues beat me up all the time that my pricing's too high, but these are the list prices that, that we can get a hold of, okay? Now, what's going to change the game probably here a little bit is generic formulations. And we do have a lot of premix formulations. Darren talked about the combination DMI uh, strobilurin uh, products now. We do have some of those that are off patent that are coming out in generic formulations for 2016. Okay? And so now we're looking at pricing. So I hear on the street, okay, I hear that the pricing is going to be more 10 to 14. Okay, so maybe you guys can agree that we're, we're down in this zone. So our current price is today maybe 3 to $4 a bushel, 4 may be strong. Uh, so the, what we're looking at here is in order to just cover our price of fungicide, I'm not figuring the application cost in here now. This is just the product. We need somewhere between 2 and a half and almost 5 bushels to cover the cost with these generics. Okay. Now, if you look back, if we, we went back just a second and looked at this slide, we're, we're right in that zone here with our VT, okay? So we're just breaking even if we look at the six-year average across the corn belt. So before this, before we had the generics and the lower pricing, we were really struggling to try to get our money back on these applications, okay? Now, we can just look at yield, okay? And there's no denying that spraying a fungicide generally on corn gives us some positive uh, return, okay? When we just look at straight up yields, okay? And we can see this, this is a trial in 2015 uh, up at Arlington. And what I did here is I just looked at the various timings and I've overlaid the number of observations we had at those timings here out of that trial. And then I just looked at straight advantage over not treating. And you can see we had in the earlier applications here, we had maybe around five bushels, the VT, uh, three and a half to four, somewhere in there. And then I've overlaid the break evens here. Okay, so the yellow area is where we would be with a generic formulation. So yes, we broke even in both the early and the uh, standard timing. 
usually it's pretty hard to see things happening down here at the two pass We're we're sort of moving away from that. We think we really need to just get things down to a one pass because it's going to be hard to make up, you know, twice the, the that bushel that I showed you in the uh, break even in order to pay for the products. So really the focus is up here. And so you can see, yeah, we, we probably broke even this year. We may have made a little money as well on some of those treatments. If we wanted to look at some other data, get out of Wisconsin, uh, maybe look at Iowa. This is some data that Allison Robertson shared from me or shared with me from Iowa. So here's some trials here, uh, looking just again at timing. And what you're looking at is the frequency distribution of success compared to the non-treated. Okay, so. Uh, obviously, bars going down would be a loss in terms of, of yield compared to the non-treated, and then a positive bar would be a, a gain. And so in, a, in the V5 timings in Iowa, you see there's a 50-50 chance, at least in the 2015 data, of having uh, some success there at the V5 timing. When you look at R1, however, the success goes up quite a bit. Okay, and again, this is why we're, we lean towards this timing as being one of the important ones. And again, you'll see the mean advantage here uh, I, over the non-treated is around five, almost six bushels, five and a half to six bushels in, in the Iowa uh, data. But again, you can see that the two-pass program, yes, it gives us a little bit higher mean yield, but really not, I wouldn't argue, a significant advantage. And so again, you know, even in the Iowa data sets, this, this VTR1 timing seems to again be the one that we, we lean towards. Now, I would argue, like Darren did in his talk, the disease levels really do matter, okay? And I know that that means we've got to get out and we've got to do some work to make that decision, and it's just not as simple as saying we're just going to spray all the corn and soybeans out there, okay? I wish it were that simple, but it's not, and we really have to consider disease here. Uh, in 2011, there was a nice research publication uh, that came out, uh, actually some data from Wisconsin when Paul Easker was here was included in that. Uh, and so I just want to show you some, some things out of that trial at that time, or out of that set of data at that time. They looked at some different products, and at that time there was still some single mode of action products being applied on corn, and so they looked at Headline, and then they also looked at some of the premix products now, which are more common. So the propiconazole plus uh, trifloxystrobin uh, combination, and then the propiconazole plus azoxystrobin combination. Now if we want to just look at straight up yield, Yes, you know, compared to the check here, so we've got these box plots which show the mean and then the variance around that mean. Yes, we, we definitely get some sort of mean yield advantage over the non-treated uh, when we look at these various products, and especially with some of the, the pre-mix modes of action here. There's no denying it. I think any pathologist will tell you, yes, they, that does happen. Now, what what you really need to consider though is how much advantage are you getting and is that really gonna actually cover your cost? Because a lot of times people get tunnel vision and they just think, well, boy, I got positive yield, okay? And, and I must be getting some advantage here, but you gotta still pay yourself. You gotta pay for the application, you gotta pay for the product. And so they took that into consideration and they split out the chances of getting your money back based on the amount of disease that was there, okay? So what you're looking at, and I've highlighted this group of, of tables here and this group of tables because these are the premix products. So these are the things that you're most likely to be spraying these days. And what you're looking at here is the probability of not offsetting your fungicide cost, so of not having success, okay? So in the uh, uh, graphs here on the left, a higher line would actually say there was less success in having and recovering your fungicide costs. Okay, versus a lower line, which would tell you that you had higher success. Okay, and so you can see where foliar disease severity was less than 5%, the odds of actually getting your money back were pretty low, okay, at the various corn prices. So these lines are just various corn prices, okay. Now, if you look at when disease severity was higher than 5%, so when, when in this case it was gray leaf spot on the ear leaves was higher than 5%, that success goes up quite a bit. Okay, and the odds of getting that back now, uh, you know, at, the, at, at some of these corn prices are actually pretty good, okay? Uh, if you could just hold the question until we get to the end because we're, we're recording here. So um, now let's look at what's going on in Wisconsin. So I can do the same analysis. This is called a meta-analysis. So I can actually go back in time. We can extrapolate that data. 
We can do another uh, uh, set of analyses on the variance and the means, and then I can calculate some probabilities for here in Wisconsin. Okay, so that's what we did. I just did this a couple of weeks ago. We went back in our data sets the last three years from 2013 through 2015. And then we used observations only from the premix uh, fungicide products. So only uh, where we had DMIs plus the strobilurins. Again, I think these are the things most relevant to the corn industry right now. And then we looked at timing, V6, V8, or VT. We had a total of 41 replicated study observations within this data set. So it's a, it's a pretty good data set uh, in that study. And then we looked at distributions and mean yield advantage and, and all these sorts of uh, tasty tidbits here. Okay, so if we can line up the frequency distribution just like we've done with uh, in previous studies here. And so what you're looking at are the yield differences relative to the non-treated check here out of those 41 studies where we had uh, those pre-mixed products. And it's interesting when you just line them up, not uh, taking into account the disease levels now, so just straight up yield, no, no disease levels in this analysis here, you can see that the distribution of positive return versus negative uh, is actually pretty equal. And actually, it's right around 51% uh, at positive return. Now, if you're into statistics, I'm, I'm, I'm into statistics, so I like to look at these things. So my confidence actually in getting this positive return is actually fairly low because the statistics tell us that the probability of chance actually comes into be a big player in this data set, mainly because the frequency distribution is pretty equal. Okay, so basically what it's saying is that we have equal odds. We have a coin flip regardless of whether there's disease out there or not of getting this 2.2 bushel mean advantage. Okay, not great odds. I don't know if I want to leave things up to a coin flip. I'm, I'm not that, that bold. Okay, now what I can do is then I can, I can go in and I can parse the data set out and account for the disease level. So I, again, this is northern corn leaf blight now because that's our main issue here. And we use the 5% uh, disease severity threshold, okay? So very similar to what was, what was done in the prior study, okay? Now on the top graph here, you're, you're looking at the frequency distribution of studies. Now we've cut that study kind of, you know, down to fewer observations here uh, because we've had to split out the high versus low disease. But you'll see when disease levels are less than 5%, we have very little, little likelihood of actually getting positive return. In fact, the mean, if you just want to look at the straight up mean, is actually a negative mean. Now, that's really not different from zero if you want to talk statistics, okay? It's not significant. However, you know, that's not, you know, very uh, positive in my mind uh, when we don't have a lot of disease around, especially northern corn leaf blight for us here in Wisconsin. Now we can look at it from the other direction. If we had high levels of northern corn leaf blight, maybe greater than 5%, now we're, now we're talking. 74% of those observations were positive. The mean yield advantage here was 5.4 bushels, and we have a highly significant mean. Okay, and this, is, this goes with what was published earlier in that other data set. They were looking at gray leaf spot, we're looking at northern corn leaf blight, but we're seeing you know, very similar responses. Now, the other nice thing that we can do with a data set like this and the, the calculations that we can do sort of in the background with, um, with the statistics is we can then come up with some probabilities of return similar to what they did in 2011. Okay, so I did that. I took those means, okay, from the high disease situation and low disease situation. I used our generic products sort of as where we're going to maybe calculate some return on investment. And then I was actually able to generate the probability of recovering the fungicide uh, application cost here. Okay, so you're, you're looking at the probability that we will get some return in this particular chart for the low foliar disease pressure. Okay, so... If our corn is somewhere between three and four dollars a bushel, and that's what we can sell it for, we're looking at this green or, or this light red uh, line here. And if we're considering the generic products, our range of success here, whoa, that's interesting. Our range of success here is somewhere between 12 and 22 percent, okay, in the low disease situation. So you'll remember from the frequency distribution, we did have a positive mean but it was only 2.2 bushels, and that's not enough to pay yourself back. You're going to lose money even though the, 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 you're, you've got a positive return. Okay? Now, in the high foliar disease pressure situation, the game completely changes. Okay? You'll see that these lines go up quite a bit. Okay? So if we look in the same scenario here using those means, 
and they and the and the corn costs three to four dollars a bushel. Now we're up at 50 to 65 percent probability of success when we use a fungicide. Okay, disease matters. Okay, and and the level of return that you're going to get matters, not just being a positive return in terms of yield. Okay. So the summary here, foliar diseases can rob yield on corn. There's no denying that. Fungicide application in fields where foliar disease pressure is high uh, equals a high odds of recovering the fungicide cost. Sure, I, I will be with you every time. Go out, spray, control the disease. That's what fungicides are for. Fungicide application in fields where foliar disease pressure is low, there's low odds of getting recovery. Sure, you might be in a field where you put a check strip in that field and you might have 30 bushels in that hot area. You might go to the next zone in that field where maybe the soil type's not as good, and you might be 30 bushels the other way. I get that question a lot. I put one strip in my field, and I had 30 bushels advantage. Okay? My argument there is go put another strip in another part of the field and see what advantage you got. You got to replicate these things across the trials okay, and take that mean advantage. And fungicide application timing, if you had to ask me what the critical timing would be in Wisconsin, I agree with my colleagues in the other states. I think the VTR1 timing is, is where, you know, the success is going to be. So you need to do some scouting uh, prior to that timing to make your decision. If you've got active disease on the lower leaves, especially northern corn leaf blight, get out there and do some application. If you don't, follow it through the, the silking period. And if you still don't think, see things showing up, then you can probably um, you know, hold off on that fungicide spray. So I just uh, kind of rattled through some of these recommendations here. Again, do some rotation, residue management. You got to do some scouting. And the best time to apply would be that VTR1 timing.